Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Matt Doyle. Drum roll, please. We've added a second Kalen to the show. It's rather wow. incredible. Kalen Kyle is a new partner in soccer. We are delighted to have you, Kalen. How do you feel in taking over for the previous Kalen on Mondays? Are you ready <laughs> to be a part of extra time well it depends what kaylin you like better and i'm hoping by the end of season of 2023 that's gonna be me uh but no i'm absolutely obviously delighted um i'm probably gonna get some heat for my first show wearing a, a red bulls jersey but these are fire okay and it's the only team in major league soccer that has officially sent me a jersey so if you're hating on it send me your jerseys and i'll wear them every week so in the pre-show meeting and in the pre-show text group text kaylin was talking about lists parenthood and she lives in New Jersey, <laughs> where like it's the vibe is good already. Sorry, you guys also you there. guys also have the same energy in meetings as well. It's like the first thing I notice. It's like, oh, Kalen is basically just Weeby. Like this is gonna be <laughs> this is gonna be a <laughs> lot. <laughs> Please help us understand what that energy is in meetings. I'm not entirely sure I know, and uh, this would help me uh, in the present and the future. I think we'll, we'll just we'll unfold that over the course of the okay. season. I okay, think. Yeah, okay, I mean. got it, got it. So, a long time pro, Kalen, 11 years, uh, more than 100 caps for Canada. We are now lucky, fortunate, blessed to say that we have a World Cup veteran on extra time, I, I believe, for the first yeah. time ever. Uh, tell people what they should expect from you. Give, give the um, full the full introduction here. The I mean, you've done it. You've basically read everything that I emailed to you late last night. So <laughs> that. Um, yeah, no, I'm. I mean, I'm honest. Let's just be completely honest. I am a very honest um, in my analyst, and you know, I love stirring the pot. I love dropping bombs, seeing if they explode, seeing if anyone's taking my bait. Um, and then obviously I do have some love for certain teams in the league because I grew up with the Vancouver Whitecaps, even though they're absolutely terrible this season and last season. So I'm hoping they turn it around there. And then I was with Inter Miami for three years. My father-in-law is the head coach for Minnesota United. So I feel like I get a lot of hate because, again, I, I support a lot of teams and now New York Red Bulls. So here we go. <laughs> Cool. Three realtors, three realtors and Kaylin Kyle. That's an inside joke for the Minnesota <laughs> folks out there. We'll, we'll get to that down the line. Do you think? Kaylin, what would you say the percentages are that by the end of this season, um, the gaffer has any positive feelings about this show? <laughs> Do you want my honest opinion? Yeah. No, I already got it. That's good. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought I was doing. When I told him I was coming on this show, he said, what the hell are you doing? Love it. Love no. it. No, he loves you guys. He genuinely loves you guys. He just loves giving you stick. He's that English, yeah. he's that, got that English flair, I will say. All right. We have uh, hours okay. upon hours That's throughout the rest of the season it. to unpack meeting personalities and our future relationship with Adrian Heath. Uh, uh, I cannot wait to see how that unfolds. But let's get into match day two. Welcome to MLS St. Louis City SC. That is the best thing I saw in match day two. I stole this because of my Midwestern roots. I'm a little complicated given the relationship between Kansas City and St. Louis. But I saw this game. I saw this crowd. I've been in the stadium. And I just thought, as we've heard Taylor Twelman say and so many others who hail from St. Louis, why hadn't this happened before? I'm looking right now at the photo and hope everybody out there listening or watching has seen it. The overhead photo of City Park, the city lit up. In the background, you can see the arch just straight down the avenue right there. It's the TIFO. It's the card stunt. It's the moment. It's fans standing for 90 minutes. It's babies being bathed in beer showers. It's Enzo Capetti being public enemy number one in St. Louis. It is a soccer city not getting their moment. Like, I, I've heard that, and I've said that, and I've sort of reflected on that. Getting their latest moment and getting their present and their future because their past is so incredible. You know, you go all the way back to 1950 and obviously way before that with the local leagues and everything else, but the 1950 World Cup, more than half the starters from St. Louis. I, I grew up hating the steamers. You know, and I, that's indoor soccer, but I, I remember in those days, the steamers were like the big thing, the big rival, arguably bigger than the Blues at times in St. Louis, and that was saying something. They had NASL, they had legends coming out of there, they had SLU, they, they had all these things. But to finally have MLS, to have this cathedral, this stadium, this place to gather, I mean, a place that the competition just to get in is going to be insane, it... It feels like um, it feels like a moment for the league, but also for the country of like, 
ah, exhale, finally, we're here. We're in a city where we were meant to be and a city that clearly just gets the game on every single level. Uh, Matt Baker is a guy in St. Louis, a super fan, I'll call him, that I've been living through on Twitter for more than a few years now. Uh, His excitement, his enthusiasm, his joy. And I know that this was all a buildup for him. He was in Austin, but I I reached out to him. I said, what was the singular moment that you remember? And he said the moment that sent chills down his spine was the STL chant that broke out the moment the players took the field for the first time. It was the fans just unable to hold anything back and wanting to explode for their guys. He said it was louder, more powerful than any sporting event I've ever been to. You knew we'd arrived and the place was exploding. It was all in perfect unison to proclaim to the entire world that St. Louis was here. I mean, he is one of thousands that experienced it that way. And we've been to these before, the first ever game, home game for expansion teams. It's once in a lifetime. It will never happen that way again, um, even though St. Louis will obviously keep raising the level for themselves as they settle into that building, into their team. But congratulations to everybody who was there. I am so happy to see St. Louis in this league. Feel Try it. following up on that rant. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> it felt good. It felt good like the game did. That was like, it, it felt like a big moment. It felt like a big game. I don't know if you guys saw Friday night. They had a huge party outside, concerts. It was packed. Like, this is one of those things. We saw it with Charlotte last year. You know, it's not brand new. Cities won MLS. But obviously, you talk about that history and that connection. It, nothing had to be generated. It feels like, and not taking away from anything the St. Louis, you know, staff has done, but you build the right building, you put a team on the field, like this city was waiting for it and and craving it. And so this was one of those events. I think everyone was sort of keyed in on this game this weekend and it completely delivered. And now it's like, yeah, if St. Louis is playing at home, I want to watch that game. Like I want to watch that atmosphere from home and I want to go. Yeah, MLS is so excited to welcome them that they're just providing gifts, coming bearing gifts of back passes and such. What was your favorite moment, Kalen? What was the moment like watching the highlights or the game or being in studio for MLS 360 where you were just sort of gobsmacked? The baby. I wanted to be the baby that was lifted up like little baby Jesus with the beer sprayed all over and not crying, by the way. I mean, I have two kids under the age of four. My kids would have been bawling, being like, Mommy, oh, yeah. take me home. What is going on? The kid was smiling. I mean, it, it was insane. And, and watching that and just watching the growth. I mean, I you know, started in the Vancouver Whitecaps organization. I've seen Major League Soccer transpire into these incredible stadiums, these incredible training facilities. And now to have one stadium, one training facility stated in the center of St. Louis, women driven as well. I mean, for me, that for for a female, I'm just taking the women aspect of it. That is amazing. I obviously can't, I have to use my words wisely because I don't want to be beeped out again. I've already been beeped out once early on in this podcast. It's only day one, but I just think that's just so incredible to see. And it's just raising the level of major league soccer for when more teams want to come in or even, you know, teams want to change stuff in their own training environments. If they're looking to refurb, they're going to look at St. Louis and be like, I want to create something like that as well. So, um, and, and players are going to want to play there. Now you want to play for, good fans you want to play for incredible stadiums you want to play and train on the best training facilities so it's not going to be hard to get good players that want to go play for st louis i also think this is just the beginning for st louis we've sort of looked at their roster and uh, been a little bit skeptical and some of that comes down to spend but you look at what they did spend on the facilities on getting this up and running and they did it during the pandemic by the way when costs got crazy as well and i was talking to taylor the other day, and he was like, this team can be really good. He's like, but watch in five years, watch in three years, watch what this organization does to build. Like, we're just seeing the baseline here. I'm also going to go Simba and Rafiki yeah. on the baby lift. <laughs> you know, like, I, that that's what I was thinking of. I don't know why it is that parents, uh, and, and I'm guessing I might have this instinct as well, like an exciting moment happens. I don't know why the first thought is like, I'm going to hoist this very delicate child high into the air, but it made for some incredible scenes. Uh, Doyle, best moment. What did you take away uh, from this this occasion? I, I think you guys all covered a lot of it. Um, the The important moment to me was that it felt like a culmination. Um, and we saw some of this in the post-game quotes. Uh, Bradley Carnell talked about how his team needed to manage their emotions because they understood that this was like a 70-year journey. The, like back when soccer was dying in the United States, it was still thriving in, in St. Louis. And, it, you know, through a lot of the things that you talked about, Weeby, you know, 
major indoor soccer league or the old NASL teams, but even before that, um, back in the fifties, when the U S made the world cup, uh, you know, and beat England in that famous game, half the team was from St. Louis, the, the semi-pro leagues in St. Louis were legendary. Um, and, and it, the game was still vibrant there where it was dying everywhere else. So it, it like in a different world, St. Louis is the first MLS franchise. Um, so for just someone who's been around the game for 40 years now and who, you know, knows pretty deeply and appreciates the history of the game uh, here in the States, finally getting there. I was more emotional about this than I thought I would be. That's one. And the other thing I took away was like, I, 85th minute whatever it was i realized the entire crowd was still standing like nobody took a seat in that entire game and we don't really see that too often uh yeah it was it was a scene it's gonna be tough to replicate that for whoever is the next one in as an expansion team whether it's you know san diego sacramento vegas phoenix detroit whoever um the bar i think has been raised a little bit higher this year with what st louis just did uh, to add to what Doyle said and obviously going to what I'm passionate about and um, sort of what Taylor mentioned, but Miguel Perez coming on as a homegrown, like yeah, this dope. is the city that's produced maybe more soccer players than anywhere else in the U.S. L.A. has their team. Jersey has their team. Dallas has their team. Like there are already two homegrowns on this roster. One came on the field in their opening game, got an applause. I think it was for Klaus coming off, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> got a ruin pretty- it. Don't ruin it. Yeah. <laughs> Got Mutual a pretty applause. big applause. We could but say like, 90 10, 90 10, right? He got some yeah. applause there. Yeah. But but that is the other part of why people have wanted this for St. Louis so so long is a place for these players who have been developed some of the best of what Scott Gallagher was able to build over the last years. We see Josh Sargent, what he's doing, Tim Ream, of course, in the EPL, and to ha- now have a, a local club to come up and come through and prove yourself in and to challenge you and to develop these players at the highest level. Um, that's really exciting and it was cool. We've seen how um, involved Lutz has been since he took over of going out and watching high school games and everything he can across the area. And that's a huge moment, I think, for MLS. And I think one thing with that as well is if you look at your U.S. men's national team, and I hate saying it, obviously, because I am Canadian, so it's still a rivalry for me, but it's so important to have these development teams for the grassroots in order for these players to go pro in their own backyard to develop and then get sold overseas. How many players from your team are now playing in some of the biggest teams in Europe. And it's huge. I mean, it's so good for not only U S men's national team, but for Canada, for Mexico, for, you know, the 2026 world cup. So I think it's phenomenal when you do look at these academies that are developing so many young talents in America, because it's one of the biggest countries. I mean, there should be more kids being produced out of this country and going pro. So yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's fun. It's exciting to see. And, Hopefully one one day my kids can play in it. I mean, look, add add on. <laughs> MLS Next Pro, add MLS Next to what is, as you said, Doyle, already just a very vibrant soccer culture that was everywhere, whether it's high school or the parish leagues or, you know, as I read Charlie Bohm's piece and talking to Taylor, like all these different sort of regional rivalries within the city that only come up over time, come up over, you know, game after game after game, fathers, sons, uncles, you know, aunts, daughters, all, all sides saying, okay, this is our sport. This is our culture. This is what we love. And I think you could sum that up in, I don't know, Anders, maybe one clip. There is something that I, I used to call football heritage. Yes, football heritage. <laughs> Jose, thank you. The impeccable time. I've been waiting to use that clip for two and a half months. <laughs> and two and a half Lewis. years. Thank you. You have finally you have, arrived for You us. have delivered. You have delivered. All right, Dave, what's the best thing you saw on match day two? We'll get to more of the soccer in St. Louis in just a bit. I'm going to stick in the Midwest, which will offend Weeby that I even called it the Midwest. If it was and- Central Time Zone, I know where you're going. I... I- is it Midwest? Is it is it Rust Belt? We can have this. So, so David, anything west of Montclair is the Midwest. Anything west of the Hudson, New Jersey is basically <laughs> the open plains. Um, no, don't hate it, New Jersey. Come on um, now, I love I, New Jersey. Good food, good people. Great people, it. great food, but <laughs> it's still it's still out there. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go to Columbus. Happy Christmas to everyone out there. First home game and. I know they had a full season last year, but it felt like post-COVID, lower.com field, this was a huge moment and a huge awakening. Sold-out stadium, TIFO on point, the fans electric, 
And for them, this felt like the first Wilfred Nance three points for them. And it's going to take a while, and there's a lot of different things he's going to do, but we saw him start to play with the toys that he has Mm -hmm. in Columbus. And um, you watch that first goal. That's Cucho playing out wide left. He basically played there the whole first half. Go and find the game, given that freedom, and Lucas Zellerion scoring two goals playing as a center forward because Cucho went out wide. And uh, DC wasn't prepared for it, and Columbus felt like they were playing for fun, which is something we've talked a lot about over the last year or two of how it started to get stale and uncomfortable and Wilfred Nance wanted to bring it back. And you look at the creativity and the goals they scored, you look at the energy in the building, like this is what Columbus thought they were getting. Their big acquisition this off season was their head coach. It's the, it's the vibe, it's the energy and it's the tactical nuance, the way that Wilfred Nance operates and what he did in Montreal. And he brought all of it to Columbus this weekend. So to be able to see that come to fruition early on, I know it's against DC, but you got to play who you play. Uh, and then the energy and, and vibe in that building, it was one of the better experiences this weekend. Shout out to Tifo Sweat, one of the many uh, really cool displays this weekend. They do incredible work in Columbus. Get, remind me, Anders, who has Lucas Zellerion and their Golden Boot team? Oh, boy. I'm just <laughs> curious. Seems like a good bet. I, I don't even, it might be me if it's me. Is it me? No, oh, oh, well, I'm, yeah. surpri- I'm so surprised. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I didn't know. I, Whoever I, made that choice is a checking, genius. Currently checking. Currently checking. While Maybe we, we should away. all put our teams down somewhere so we would know. I, know. Who's I on need our to put team. it on like a whiteboard above my desk here so I can remember. It's fine, we, dude. I'm I'm just gonna win off Cucho assists. Like yeah, Jordan Moore is gonna win Golden. It's about tiebreaker. <laughs> That's the percentage play here. Exactly. Assist. Exactly. Yeah. Doyle, best thing you saw. Uh, I'll, I'll stick around in, in Ohio. The post-game press conference with Wilfred Nancy, he, he really went in depth talking about what he wants to see from this team, talking about how there were moments where they were playing too fast and there were moments where they were playing a little bit too, uh, too urgently, and he wants less of that. He wants them to be methodical. He wants them to, uh, you know, draw the opponents upfield and then bypass them with third line passes. And he he really was specific about what he was seeing. Um, and then the other team in Ohio, uh, Cincinnati, they they didn't have as good a performance, but like Pat Noonan really went in depth talking about what was going right with his Cincinnati team compared to last week and what was going wrong. Um, and why he was, I think, happier with the draw than he was with the home win last week. And, you know, specifically how he was setting up his forwards to, you know, eliminate uh, easy distribution into Pereira in the the central midfield for for Orlando. Uh, like, there was a level of, of um, detail and a level of transparency, uh, transparency from those two guys in particular. But we saw it, I, I think, from Bradley Carnell somewhat, talking about the difference between the press and the game press with St. Louis. And we saw it from uh, Luchi Gonzalez as well. Uh, guys really opening up and saying, like, okay, if, if you ask, we are going to give you the blueprint. We are going to tell you what we were trying to do, what worked, why it worked, what didn't work, why it didn't work. And we haven't always gotten that over the years. So I, I just, you know, a round of applause to those coaches I named and probably a half dozen others uh, who who really went out of their way to sort of paint a picture of what they were trying to do tactically. I certainly appreciate it. Um, but, I, you know, you guys all look a little bit bored. Maybe, I'm, maybe not, not? I'm not bored at all. I guess okay. I'm, I'm wondering, because mm-hmm. I remember in the Greg Burhalter era, Greg coming to our offices in New York City and literally diagramming you know, like play and like his mode of play for you and Bobby. And then he sort of drew that back over his time with the national team. And I always wondered if maybe he realized it wasn't going to benefit him as much to be as open. And I am by no means encouraging any coach to be less open about how they want to play in this league. I just wonder what you would think about whether or not how much it benefits those guys. I think it benefits them a lot. I I, I think there, there is still a a chance to, make the conversation smarter and you do that by trusting fans you do that by like giving them the tools to have more educated conversations about the game um i don't think that burhalter really drew it back all that much over the course of his four years i thought he was pretty consistently the most open 
uh, head coach that the national team has had, even though, you know, he did dial it back from like the first week. Um, and and I, I, you know, it did make the discourse worse in the U.S. somehow. But I, I guess I'm, you know, a starry eyed optimist when I say that coaches doing this is a good thing. We like we need to to be smarter as a a soccer community and having the guys who are calling the shots actually open up and tell the fans what they're trying to do. Um, that's a step forward as far as I'm concerned. I also I don't think Greg dialed it back with the media. I think he dialed it back. I think after a year he realized. I mean, fair, yeah. It's a he less couldn't do as much system. tactically yeah. as he wanted to with the national team, and I think he simplified it for everyone. So it wasn't that he was only talking to us about verticality. I think that's what he was working on, and that's what he was doing, and that was the reality of being a national team coach. But I would add, you know, a lot of these markets, one, some some are new in MLS, and a lot are growing. You have people coming to games, not just fans, to cover that aren't soccer people. And I do think that there's a really good spot for coaches to help those people grow. And if you're a coach, put your ideas out there first. Establish the way people see the game as the way you see the game, because so that's one of the beautiful things about soccer is people feel there are right and wrong ways to play, but there's no proven formula, right? It's not the NFL where you just let's just score touchdowns. It doesn't really matter how you do it. Like there is this belief in people said in by the, a true Jets fan, right? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> right? So there's like no nuance. To Big this. Aaron Rodgers guy. But Big here's Aaron the thing. Guy. But here's the thing. Is, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that a very American thing to say, though? Like coaches need to educate fans or is that just in soccer that you're alluding to? I, I think it's in all sports. Yeah. But what is in other leagues talk to the fans about how they're playing? I, I'm obviously well, maybe I'm very new to this, but I've never really heard of this before. So I would say, though, obviously soccer has less history here. So there's less knowledge in fan bases and teams and, and whatever. But here's yes. my here's my example. Diverse country, though. So there is a lot of football knowledge here. I yep. mean. In different states, for sure, I think that changes. But I don't necessarily agree that coaches need to come out and educate fans, though, because you don't see – I haven't seen that in other sports. Basketball, NBA, do you see coaches coming and, and having that conversation with people? There's more access in a lot of other sports because there's, one, more games. Like, NBA coaches have to talk before and after every game. So they're talking – about what they're doing fairly often. And a lot of times you'll see NBA coaches, for example, that's the one I follow the most, yeah. talk about, well, we didn't play him in these minutes because the analytics are actually telling us or what we saw on tape was he doesn't match up well with bigger guards. And so we're going to try and shift that. Like, I do think a lot of coaches like to explain their thinking so you know there's a thought process. And my example in MLS would be, I've had a lot of conversations over the last few weeks with people asking, why isn't Jovalich and Chicharito going to play together? And I don't think it helps Greg Vanny to not say anything. But do you because... think it's all the questions of people asking them? So like when they do get these media, because has there been a media person asked them in a press conference? A million conference? times. Right? Yes. And what, yeah. He, and he then... did recently say that he doesn't think that it's going to work. Yeah. But he's he said defensively he 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 has not gone into detail about their their pressing shape or their I mean they're a very mid block team and like why you can't play two forwards in a, a mid block system which is like that's kind of designed for two forwards. Sorry, David, go ahead. No, no, I don't disagree. I'm just, again, I don't think he has been asked the question. And I don't think he's gone into depth with his answer. And I, one of the things that a lot of people walked away from the early parts of Greg Berhalter were at least there's a thought process and at least there's a process mm -hmm. and you might disagree, well, but you really can respect there's that. a process, which a lot of people in this country for the two coaches before him felt there was no process. And so when things went wrong, there was not reasoning. And I do think fans react poorly to that. And I do think media reacts poorly to that. That's not the coach's job. But anything that makes a coach's job easier, I think, is something you'd want to do. Mm. All right. Best thing you saw in match day two, Kalen. <laughs> I'm already in here stirring things I up. I love it. Inaugural it's journey. Great. I'm going to be kicked off week one. Um, best thing that I saw, I know I'm drinking out of an Orlando uh, Studios coffee mug, but I'm going down to Florida, not with Orlando. I'm going down to Inter Miami. I think for me, you look at the Robert Taylor goal. Sorry, I, can't, I see your jersey. I'm just not there yet. I didn't want to put my pink Miami uh, jersey on today, but Robert Taylor's goal, Taylor's goal, excuse me, unbelievable. Goal of the week could be goal of the month. We will see. Um, I think it's just phenomenal. But I, I, I will say Inter Miami and Phil Neville specifically, Phil Neville has been highly criticized these last two years. And I think people forget that they had a basically a, a financial 
hook on their team where they couldn't make TAM signings, they couldn't make GAM signings, he couldn't move players in and out. He was taken over a team where he didn't pick any of the players. So he's had to work with that for two years. He's had DPs that didn't work out in this league other than Gonzalo Higuain, obviously in his last season, he did a good job because Phil Neville said, you either buy into my system, you get fit, or you'll sit on the bench. But this season, I, I mean, speaking to Phil Neville, and I think this is what excites me about this Inter-Miami side, and I know someone had wrote in, are they in or title to um, MLS Cup? I'm not ruling them out because of the way they're without Capana, one of their new DP players. They just got Joseph Martinez. Joseph Martinez trying to find his feet in South Florida. I think it's the best team this guy could have gone to. You have Jean um, uh, that just come back off injury, got a goal in his second game there, second start. You have Mata and Gregory that have this partnership in the middle of the pitch that covers so much ground, and they finally have a good back line. They haven't had a good back line since they're not – ever since Inter Miami has started. You have McVeigh that's finally playing in his position in the center back role. He was kind of a makeshift fullback uh, the last season. You have Kristoff that's come in and is that big center back, the communicator that just tightens up the team parts. Drake Callender that signed his contract extension there. And then you have Pizarro. No one's really spoken about him. I mean, since coming in, everyone was like, he's not good enough for this league. He's a fantastic player. Him and Gonzalo Higuain hated each other. The kid had no confidence. So I was speaking to Phil sent him a message there the other day and I just said, all right, tell me what you don't tell the media. And he said, Pizarro has come back and he has almost the the weight lifted off of his shoulders. He doesn't feel like he's being bullied by Gonzalo Higuain. He can play as a free player. And I think that's huge. Now, do I think he's the best number 10 in the league? No. Do I think he could be one of the top players in the league? Yes. If his confidence does come back into him, but this team for me, I, they're going under everyone's radar, I think, because you know, when you think into Miami, you think David Beckham, you think they should have these big signing stars. I think that will come. I'm hopefully messy down the road. Um, but then he went and won the World Cup. 55, I, I, 55 points over under. I, I can't I can't see Messi coming in the next year and a half. No, OK, but this you're, you are singing the praises of Inter Miami. Yeah, 50, 55 points over or under. Mm. Can I wait, wait till week four? No. 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 <laughs> we just went on over my hands. I'm going over. I am. Okay. I think I I genuinely, I, I. So that's basically, that's a top three team in the Eastern Conference. And he I says they want to be top four. That's what they're targeting. So you can you can take the boy out of England. You can't take England out of the boy. <laughs> just top four is all we care hey, about. Phil, that's not, you don't get in the Champions League that way, my guy. <laughs> what, do you guys not think that they're a good team? Do uh, you not think that they're a good team? I think they're I think they're a middling team right now. They had a really good performance. They have a they have a match winner and goal. Um, they have gotten some buy in uh, from Joseph and Pizarro, which has definitely helped. Um, but I I'm still not sure that Joseph is a lead the line guy like before. But he doesn't uh, need to be. He's got Capana doing that. Well, then I'm not sure. If you do that, then you put Joseph and Capana up top. Neither of those guys defend. Right. And then it becomes easier to build out against that midfield. OK, I mean, that's kind of a problem. But then you add a number 10 to that mix, which they don't really have right now, but they're trying to have soon. Then you have three guys who don't defend and then you start getting pulled apart a little bit. So I, well, I like I, I think like if obviously, the ten is messy, it changes a lot of it. Yeah, it, I mean, for, for sure. But like we're, we're not certain that Messi is going to be the one who who comes. But. Any like either way, even after the performance he, against Philly and the mid, it was it was, a, it was a, known in transition to be so dangerous. They didn't. They were played off the park by Inter Miami, one of the best teams that everyone says it's going to finish first in the East. I don't know if I would say played off the park. Yeah, but I don't know that I totally agree. And you have the wonder goal which pops up. I don't know. I didn't think my so Doyle, you're talking defensive. Had a good game though. I thought well, they, they played they, well, but they I they did not. Well, think, yeah. I did not think they created chances. Exactly. I thought, well, I thought, no, 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 I didn't think Miami did. Like, the first goal, I don't know if Blake sees it late. It's yeah, surprising he, he's that completely that goal, unsighted. Yeah, I'm surprised that goal goes in against Blake. And the second one is arguably the best goal of the year, but not out of a, a pace, moment of play. It's a moment of brilliance. Otherwise, I thought Philly had the better chances. That's my issue is Pizarro, I think, is a good player. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's in the final third. He's not even in the realm of the top players in MLS. It's not his skill set. And if they don't have a 10, I don't know how they score goals 
consistently. I thought they played fine against Montreal last week, but clearly Montreal is in a bad moment. And I didn't think Miami played them off the park either. So a little note here, you're talking about Andre Blake. Opta went and did the research on this. Both of Inter Miami's goals came outside the 18. That's just the third time in 217 MLS matches for Andre Blake. That includes the playoffs. And the first time since 2019 that Blake was beaten from outside the box twice in a single match. It's so like that almost never happens. What's the ding? We're a big, this is a sound podcast, ambient sounds, random sounds, leaf blowers, uh, is it radiators knocking. No. It's not Who's me. got the bing? Who's binging? It's is it you, me. Weeby? No, I, I promise it's not me. I'm You're in a new it. house. Okay, it might be. It might be Kalen. That's I'm a good intr- That's a good entrance to, to extra time, Kalen. Random noises are our brand. Why <laughs> I'm getting blamed for this. I'm on silent. I promise you. Oh my gosh! Texting, texting me. Who is it? I, my though. phone's on do not disturb. <laughs> yeah. My this Apple is, phone. This is 100% David doing a bing bong thing after yeah. that next <laughs> win last night. Bing bong. Well, here, was the, here was the question on Inter Miami from both Zilly and Ash. Are Inter Miami serious contenders for the Shield this year? And uh, also, should we? is that an overreaction? Is it an overreaction for folks to be so high on Miami this far? I feel I, like it's an overreaction. Yeah, you should definitely be. Yeah, you should definitely yeah, just, be I'm happy with, with six points. But yeah, like, this is this is not a shield team. Is currently I, constructed. They don't have any depth on the back line. Um, they're not creating chances at a high level. They're competing like <laughs> they showed last year that they'll continue to compete like. <laughs> but like we're we're talking, I think a year away from this team coalescing into the type that could. You talk about creating win. chances. You look at Nashville. Look how far they've gotten. Yes. Yeah, there's a they, there's a system. They, is, wait, is Nashville is Nashville a shield contender? I'm not oh. saying that they're not. I'm not saying that they aren't. But I'm just saying you're you're talking about stats. Everything's stats. Football, and I understand like a lot of people are so fixated on stats, but sometimes stats don't tell I'm, the. I'm story. not talking. I'm not talking about stats. I'm talking about tactical approach, right? Like if if Miami puts enough attacking talent out there to win games consistently, then they take their ability to defend across the pitch off the table as currently constructed. But now, you have two defensive midfielders that literally do that job. You have Gregory and Mata. Neither of them are box-to-box midfielders. They screen and they do all the dirty work for everyone. They do a lot of dirty work, but they gave up 60 goals last year, Kalen. But they like also they, didn't have the back line that they have. And, and they got smoked the in the playoffs. I mean, we're, like, we're going to agree to disagree here, but there's like – as currently constructed, I like six points from two from two games at home. That's a great start to the season, and like the the bones of this team, very good. But like they're they're pieces short. I would add this. So I was talking. I think Patrice Bernier about this this morning. Um, stacking points matters because I don't know that anyone is there in the entire league. I don't think there is a monster. If it is Philly, which it could be, they have CCL to deal with. So. I think for Miami to be good to competent right now or competent to good, competent to great, whatever, and stack points could put them in the running for that because if you are already starting ahead as teams start to solidify or maybe teams don't throughout the season, then you have a shot to contend at the top of a conference. So I think being who they are right now is a step ahead of most other teams. I'm going to agree with Anders in the chat, which is that Seattle don't have CCL to deal with and nice. already look like juggernauts, so we might actually have a monster. It's just the same old monster up in Seattle. Uh, quick question on the on the Union. Anybody concerned about that performance as it relates to going to uh, into CCL against Alianza this week? Well, no, I think they had half an eye on it and didn't play their best, but I don't worry about this team in big moments. I think that's been proven over the last four years okay all right Who's i do on? appreciate anders being so excited about his team potentially challenging for the rocky mountain cup this year mm. <laughs> all right let's uh let's keep it moving here we'll get back to st louis we'll get to lafc uh, i think this is a good transition straight into the sounders 2-0 over rail salt lake top of the league uh dominant wins back to back doyle i said on uh, mls wrap up that uh, i think that this is a team this is a team that can go for multiple trophies, and I, I don't, I'm not going on a limb there. It's a pretty solid limb. Where do you see the Sounders in this particular moment? A bear in, don't even need Rui Diaz. Jordan Morris has got three goals already. You got 90 minutes out of Jao Paulo for the first time in, what, what more than a year. They're, they're back. They're just back. 
Yeah, it, it feels like they're back and they look like the team that they were last year, this time of year when they were en route to winning CCL before all the injuries hit. And we shouldn't be surprised that Jordan Morris, when healthy, is looking like a best 11 caliber winger. We shouldn't be surprised that Eber, when healthy, is excellent. I love that offseason pickup. They're deeper now. Zhao Paulo looking like himself. We shouldn't be surprised. Nico Ladero in a contract year, looking like the best number 10 in the league. That's probably not a surprise either. Um, it's it's all good right now in Seattle. I think the fans are right to be hyped. Um, they're doing a lot more work with the ball than I think we tend to see from Seattle. Uh, however, these were two games that they should have won. And they're on the road at Cincinnati this weekend, um, which will be a better test of just how close they are to being the sort of apex version of this team that they've looked like in the past two weeks. And I, I think the part that I'm excited to see is to see Reagan and Yaimar, but mainly Reagan be challenged consistently at a high level and Cincinnati will do that. They're direct. They've got a ton of center forwards. Lucho will take up that spot. That's just RSL and Colorado at home to start the year. And, you know, Colorado without Rubio and RSL leaving the dog at home because they couldn't get the flight. <laughs> um, it, it was not the test. So credit to Seattle. And I think to Doyle's point of the possession, they handled these games probably better than they have in the past because they had a, a, a clear way to break down teams that came to not open up. Uh, and that's been a struggle for Seattle at times over the last few years. But my biggest question mark with this group being that Ariaga was one of the high level center backs and now can't play because they don't want him on the team, whatever is going on is Jackson Reagan. And I thought, I think coming out of club world cup, he, he rebounded. Well, he's looked really good over the first two games, but this is a different challenge. Yeah. Well, it's a shame. We didn't get to see Jackson Reagan. <laughs> Benzema. And Vinicius, I mean, that's oh my God. one of those opportunities. Uh, sorry, that's a direct steal from Anders in the chat. There that are moments we need stolen. Anders actually in the show, and I just had to give him his, his due for that one. I Top don't three... have Anders in the show, by the way. No, we, we, we should. I know. We need to find a way to get him in here. We just use the chat if, as our... Uh... If Seattle continues... This has already been more miserable than all of last year was with Anders. If Seattle continues to win, he cannot be on the show. If Inter Miami <laughs> lose their next two, Anders can sub in. <laughs> <laughs> how about this how about this Kaylin? we're like we're praising the sounders they're back they're back they're back we just got done talking about the union if you had to put three teams into a sort of like best team in the league could be or are right now category what three teams would go into that for you either side west or east anywhere right? in the league yeah um i was really rooting on austin they've really let me down i'm not gonna lie um lafc okay Philly. I just think Philly. they have a game because they just they're just they have a lot of quality. And then how do you go away from Seattle? Can you? No. Oh yeah, Seattle. Seattle would be okay. my third. Seattle okay. actually I think right now would probably be they're they've been one in my MLS rankings the last two weeks. So yeah, I would go I would definitely do Seattle for sure after their performance. So but if we bring honors in, how is this gonna be any different? No, I'm just kidding. Just messing with <laughs> Um how about this one for you, Dave? Early signs of the best offseason move, uh a bear. Uh, September Olsen says, Rui Diaz as a super sub now with Ebert fitting nicely into the 11. Does Schmetzer disrupt the flow? Start two up top. Ebert already a uh, cannot remove player in the 11, apparently. He has the most missed chances in the league so far with five, which just tells you they're just creating a ton. Two That's good what goals you want. from him. That's what you want to hear. Missing <laughs> so many chances. You have so many chances that you're basically gifting them. He's... He's Mother Teresa out there. Yeah, like he exactly. doesn't even want to score the goal. Just giving the other team a chance. Yeah, Just you got to keep people like in they're a little no, bit involved. But listen, I understand because I think Eber's missed more chances than NYCFC has generated this year. That's so correct. that 400k in allocation really came in use for NYCFC. I'm glad they don't have the starting center forward that we be questioned for three plus years with them, and they are showing why they are better without him. I didn't question him. Well, you, said, spent, you, you spent the last you half did. of last year saying they couldn't win with him, with Tati gone. Then he left, and now they're bad, so it feels like you did. Yeah, it, there are elements of truth to that. Elements, but it's not the whole truth. I just said they needed another player to compliment him so that it would be like a, you know, a little bit of maybe a rotation, or maybe he's a backup like he is, I, I don't know, in Seattle. Yeah. Just saying. Well, I picked Rui Diaz for my Golden Boot team, so. <laughs> it shows showed my confidence in there. Oh, but by the way, Tom has Lucas Zellerion, so yeah. I my memory was 
poor and so was Doyle's I, on that. Sometimes there are moments in MLS where you're asking what's going on and like people letting Seattle trade for a starting player yeah. is one of those moments. People letting Philly trade for Damian Lowe for 250k is Julian one of those Ronzo moments. Too. No, yeah. that's not one of those moments. Yeah, if you I, watched his games back, that's not that's one of those. That's fair. Moments. But but that's watch, no. But watch 50% of the league's starting center backs right now and then I think you I would sway back into the he can play for a lot of teams. You would have him start on your team? Uh, over, we could start naming teams. There's a lot I would start him on right now. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's, uh, how about we go to LFC? Uh, so they got the rings. Pretty cool. Gareth Bale is back. You had a later tea time to get to. Still want to play with you, Gareth. If you ever, you know, mini golf, whatever, I'm down. I will fly out there with my clubs. 3-2 uh, <laughs> over Portland. Portland just absolutely dire. Horrendous, shameful, shambolic on set pieces in the first half. Uh, OptiJack had another great stat on this one. LAFC have won their season opener in all six of their MLS seasons. That's the longest streak of opening wins in league history, tying FC Dallas from 2012 to 17. Uh, what do you guys think of the ring? Anybody have strong thoughts on the blacked out we championship did. ring? We had it in studio and it was unbelievable. I think it, maybe everyone was like, it's not the real thing, but it felt really real and it was un. <laughs> Believable. I wanted to steal it, but I really liked it. It was super classy. Um, yeah, loved all the detailing. I think that it was like Carlos Vela's that they yeah. had sent, but not Carlos Vela's that they had sent, clearly. Um, but yeah, no, it was uh, it was really, really beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Loved it. I like the shield and the cup on the side, and the shield being diamond plated is a cool look. Yes. On top yeah. of black diamonds. Yeah. yeah, the whole I think the whole thing just really I mean it, it fit the club. The the vibe, the brand, the accomplishment, it was all great. Uh, and then they baptized themselves in the holy waters of domestic beer uh, throughout this match, <laughs> uh, according to Will Farrell. Giorgio Chiellini scored his first MLS goal. He's the fifth oldest to score in Major League Soccer and the oldest to score his first at 38 years, and I believe 212 days. Uh, it shouldn't have counted. Watch instant replay. Myself and Christina Uncle spotted an offside in that one. An offside uh, on the corner? Yeah, Ilya, when Ilya plays the ball back for the cross, actually in an offside position there. Um, it's it Oh, because they played short. Yeah, just go watch the show. You'll see. Uh, but I want to quiz you guys now. <laughs> Who are the oldest, the four older players that scored in MLS? Their debuts? No, no. just just. But it's their first Pre goal? Pre not their first goal. It's just oh. overall older players. Because only four players have scored that were older. I'm sure Kai Kamara will, will get there here at some point. Zlatan? Uh, nope. Preki is one. Preki, Preki is the 42 years, 113 days Preki scored. Wanda? He scored 20 goals at, at an older age than Giorgio Chiellini is right now, That's which is wild. just nuts. Preki, Wando. Wando is one. 30 uh, years, 283 days on Wando. Hugo? Hugo Sanchez? Uh, Carlos El Matador. Oh, right. El Matador. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Did we get all of them? No, you have one no, more. 30, uh, what, about, what about low time? You mean Carlos Suarez? I'm oh, sorry, uh, Carlos Suarez. Claudio Suarez. No, no, no. no. This is Carlos mean, Suarez. And no, I think, I think I you mean Claudio Suarez. Claudio. Yeah, why, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't get it. You have the oh. wrong answer. Yeah. <laughs> Shocker. Shocker. Terrible research. One more. And it's a legend. With the hair to match. Oh, Pibe. Pibe. Oh. Yep, PB. 40 years, 272 days. So, If I'm yeah. 40 and still able to run to <laughs> the gym, I'm going to be delighted with myself. Yeah, it is. I'm just trying to be standing. <laughs> You're just point. trying to get that the dust off your Peloton. That's what Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, we got to move that out of the way. It doesn't get used. It just gets rotated through my basement to tape extra time. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on Mahala Poku as the starting nine? Scored a goal? He wasn't really he the wasn't. starting nine. Yeah. Okay. Vela, Vela started and as a false nine. Conceptually, there was the a lot of graphic. Yeah, there was a there was a lot of interchange between the two of them. I thought this was the best they looked for an hour. I thought this was the best they looked when they've had Vela as a, a starting false nine. He was really active, dropping off, obviously, and they seem to have very good chemistry in terms of like when I drop, you go. So they the center backs were always being occupied uh by by one of those two guys and like credit to vela he was even making some hard direct runs at times that he wasn't getting the ball but they weren't meant to it was just meant to to create a little space it, it was it looked good for an hour and i thought buke is that sir? that's how they were yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i thought he looked dangerous off the bench and so 
of my concerns for LAFC, I think a lot of them went away over the course of the first 90 of seeing Vela play in that position well, um, seeing Apoku take up those positions that he did and be dangerous, and then having that quality on the bench that could also be a center forward option um, as well. I thought Tillman looked fine because they don't really have depth in central midfield. He's like the one piece they brought in. I thought he looked good for his segment. Doyle's anti. I mean, pass the ball forward. Just just do it once. Try it. See if you like it. <laughs> You're up. What do you need to? <laughs> well, they, they were they were flirting with not being up. Portland tore back. Evander got a goal in this one. Uh, it looked like maybe there was going to be a 3-3, a draw on this uh, wonderful day for LFC. It didn't happen. Any takeaways from Evander through two games, Kalen? I think he's good. I, I think definitely there's that transition, right? When you go into a new league as a new player and the pressure that you have on you, I think he's got the quality to be a fantastic player in Major League Soccer. Obviously getting the goal, that always helps with confidence as a player, but we were touching on this earlier on, not in this show, but just uh, behind the scenes of that transition. You know, how long is too long for a transition with a player within this league? So I, I do think there's good potential there. I am concerned with the supporting cast around him. That is my one big concern because he's a fantastic player. But if you're not getting, you know, the quality service, the good runs and movement in and around you, getting him behind to open up that space, uh, it's obviously more work and more pressure on the player. But I do think he has what it takes to be successful in Major League Soccer. He, pa- he, he passed the eye test for you? He, he looks like a 10 to you? Yeah, I think so. I think he's good. I think obviously it's only week two. It's going to take time. But it's the the supporting cast around that I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about. Yeah, he uh, he definitely is the odds leader for Goss Theorem Player of the Year next year. But <laughs> I agree with you, Kalen, in his physical talent, his touch, his vision. Like, it's all there. It's just understanding the speed of what's happening around you, the teams you're playing, and then having the pieces. If you don't have a finisher up top, it's going to make his life harder. And that they got Frank Boley. And we didn't talk about it much, I don't think, last week. Um, to me, it just felt like another roll of the dice uh, of an equal quality, but Nishkot has been bad the first mm-hmm. two weeks, so maybe that fresh energy just gives them something they haven't had. Uh, we've talked a lot about St. Louis already, but we didn't really talk about the soccer, Doyle, so maybe we can narrow in on that one. Mm-hmm. 3-1 win against Charlotte FC. Uh, the moment we've covered all of that. Um, we haven't touched the back passes. Broadcast ruiner. Uh, also, uh, not a trumpet 39 on Twitter. I just I, I can't understand how people choose their username sometimes. But uh, he is not a trumpet, and he asks who on each team will give St. Louis a goal because they've been given two already. Um, I mean, they I, were given they were given all three in this one. Yeah, that's true. An own goal, and then a Swiderski thrust his hand into a crossing lane um, defensive moment. Football Profits hit us up and said, do you think St. Louis City's performances are replicable going forward? Six goals scored, one pin, one incredible own goal. Two airheaded back passes seems like a bit of beginner's luck. And I can already feel St. Louis bristling at that accusation. What do you think? Beginner's luck? I don't think they're going to score over 100 goals this year. So, no, I don't think this is replicable going forward. But the way they play, right, their energy drink soccer, um, they, they want to create as much chaos as is possible. And um, that is a very good strategy early in the season when teams are still getting their feet under them and aren't as clean with the ball, aren't as clean with their movements, uh, don't have their escape patterns down. Uh, it, it works, and it's worked for them for two games, and they've gotten some gifts on top of it. They compete like hell. Um, Klaus, I think, is is pretty legit. Let's go. Leuven is clearly legit. Yeah, um, it, like it, they're they're not gonna be expansion season Cincinnati, right? Like they, they have already they have already taken that hurdle. I, I'm skeptical that they're going to be a playoff team. I think they leave themselves way too open uh, for those counterattacks, which is something that you live with if you're a high-pressing team, right? Because you you make the bet that you can force them into a bad pass or force them into a turnover. Or even if they complete the first pass, you're there for the second pass to force a turnover on that one, and you're stacking all these chances to create the type of chaos that you want, and that's worth it to you uh, for, the, you know, because like you are going to eventually win the ball and shove it down their throat, it's worth leaving yourself open at the back occasionally. I I have my suspicions that that will play out somewhat negatively over the course of the season as it gets hotter and as teams get better with the ball. But it's like 
they took six points from two games, man. They had like one of the greatest crowds I have ever seen in any sport. They have clearly gotten a few of their biggest signings right. And Bradley Carnell, it like really impresses me every time I hear him talk. And like I, what he did with the Red Bulls a couple years ago, and that that really impressed me too. So like I think there's a ton of reasons to be enthusiastic about this. Even though like if you go back and watch the tape, there were a million chances for Charlotte to absolutely kill them. And if Charlotte had better wingers, they'd have scored four goals in this game. Has has their games look chaotic, though? Like you said, chaos. Have I, I haven't seen chaos from them. I think they have a clear playing style that they want to play. But I don't think they, they play chaotic when they, when they do have the ball. So I think they're probably 15% more about soccer than car crashes than I thought they would be. Um, but they're still super direct. You know, they still they're still hitting 45 percent of their passes are going forwards, which is like you don't you don't play that many for, forward passes um, if you're not looking to create 50 50s chances to win the ball. And to the point like, you know, they, they started a four two 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 in this one with Giochini next to Klaus and like Carnell said afterwards, like we wanted to do that for defensive reasons. We wanted to create more chances uh, to win the ball off their back line, off their goalkeeper. And he didn't use the word chaos, but he basically said we wanted to instill that type of rapid change of possession into the game. And to me, that's chaotic. Um and that's fine. Like if you're facing a team that wants to control play, like remove their ability to do that. They're now playing the game on your terms. And I think that they were able to do that for maybe the first 20 minutes. And then it swung to Charlotte a little bit. And then right before the half, it swung back to, to St. Louis. And then the second half, Charlotte was, was doing everything they could to kind of take over the game. And they were pressing emotionally, not pressing in terms of soccer, but they, I think they were pressing emotionally, trying to meet the moment. And that's when, I mean, St. Louis, because they have that very clear idea of how they want to play, they were in the right moments to take advantage of it. See, and I saw the game, I mean, am I, I'm going to jump in here, sorry. Go, go. I, when I'm looking at that game, that that's tactical and that's momentum changes. This is So I don't find that chaotic. I think they are playing to their strengths. They have a very good young midfielder. They have a good target number nine. And I think what they did to Charlotte brilliantly is Charlotte was trying to press. They went long to open up the space. They collected in the midfield, broke them down in those team parts, got, okay, maybe a gifted goal, but still to be able to finish that opportunity, it's easier than looks. And then they tried closing out the game defensively, St. Louis. I think... For me, tactically, they outplayed Charlotte in that. Charlotte, yeah, okay, you can say they had opportunities from wingers, but I wouldn't necessarily think that that's chaotic and that it's, I don't know. Let me ask you this, Kaylin. As a former defender, and still in your heart and and soul, I'm sure, I was a midfielder. Oh, I I was wrong. I'm sorry. You won that one? Go on. All right. Back passes, though. (laughs) How replicable, like, where are those coming from in your mind? Because you said this is sort of controlled chaos from St. Louis. This is what they want it to look like. Well, because they pick their moments of when to press. And Klaus, you've seen on both opportunities, just kind of hanging in the wind. And, and maybe it's because he's exhausted. Obviously, we saw the first game. He did look like he had no legs under him. But that's what you want to see from a player like that, leaving everything on in the pitch. For me, those are two mental lapses as a defender. The first one, it almost looked like he had thought, because when he, he didn't even actually look in the first game. I think it was, is it Kip Keller, the, mm-hmm. the, the back mm-hmm. pass? Mm-hmm. I think it, it was the, the cleverness of actually getting shouted and he thought it was his goalkeeper. But the second one, he clearly makes eye contact. That for me is mental fatigue, legs that are going on you. First couple, there's no excuse. At this level, you should not be doing that. I, I mean, if that is my center back, I am losing it at the moment in time. Like you just, it's unacceptable at this moment in this game at this level to make bad back passes like that. But for me, it's fatigue. It's early on in the season where you don't have that 90 minute match fitness. I'm trying to make excuses for these players, but there really is none. Like you should not be making passes like that ever. What's it, Charlotte, Dave? I mean, you're more interested in your cat than me breaking down. Mm -hmm. I can do both. Come on. It's it's part of the brand. This is part of the, it's part of the show. If this is how it's going to happen for the rest of the season, I'm in. Bring it on. Dave, Charlotte, what'd you see? Uh, I liked some of the ideas they had. Um, it, Derek Jones was awesome in this game. Brant Bronico has been really good as well. Ashley Westwood was a big signing for them. So they brought Jones in and slid Bronico to left back to keep Westwood on the field. 
I don't know if that makes the most sense. And I don't know that they got width from that left side. And Joe's react was actually okay, but all of his best moments were coming inside. Um, so there wasn't a ton of width on that left side. And then it felt like all of the moments that Andre Shinyashiki found were moments where I'd rather have Carol Swardowski in that spot. And I know he had an assist from right mid, but Shinyashiki was put through twice. Those are spots where I think Swiderski scores goals. Like that's what he does at his best. And what we saw from Swiderski last year as a 10 was very quick to get the ball off his feet to runners if he feels like the through ball is there. And Shinyashiki waited a little bit longer. So I think the framework of a lot of it is there. I don't know that it was executed to perfection in this one. The other thing I'd add is I think Milanda is one of the best young center backs we've ever seen in Major League Soccer. But there's a reason he came here, and that's to grow. And one of them is physically, and Klaus dominated that matchup. And if you go back and watch, it was like the 20th minute. Klaus puts his arm around Melanda and takes a throw in, and Melanda drags him down because that's the overreaction. If you feel like you're being beat physically, you overreact to try and win the battle. And from that moment on, Klaus dominated Melanda wherever he wanted to. So that's something that Charlotte just can't afford because he's too key to what they do. And that's not going to be every week. I think Klaus might be the best, most physical center forward in this league already. So it'll be a different test, but I thought Charlotte has some good ideas. I'm not worried about them. I know it's two losses in two games, but I still have a level of belief that the floor or the, at least the baseline of this team is pretty high. I'm sticking with you, Charlotte. Had you fifth in the East? Yeah. Don't know that I'm, I'm still feeling the fifth necessarily, but it can happen. And I no, still I, believe in you. I do as well. Sorry. I'm just going to jump in here again. I like to talk for if anyone didn't know. Um, I think Charlotte, for me, I think a lot of of it's coming down because they have the players, right? They they you, We saw that last season. Manager, first time he's taking over a full preseason, but they had an unfortunate event happen in their preseason, losing one of their players. Mentally, that is very difficult to deal with as a player. So you can have the best starting 11 in the league. You can have one of the best center backs. You can have Capetti, but that is mentally so draining. So I think we have to take that back into consideration that Charlotte have been through so much. The players have been through so much. The community have been through so much. And what we know about Charlotte, the fans are going to continue to support this team and that's what they need. But I think moving forward, we're going to continue to see the Charlotte side grow on the pitch because of everything they went through off the pitch. And that was my, my big thing leading into 2023 is the reaction of these players. And I think you're seeing it. You can kind of see the little bit of mental fatigue in them, which is which is normal. I mean, from everything that they have gone through. So this team excites me as well. I mean, you, you saw moments of brilliance from this team and moments where you're like, oh, wow, Capetti is going to be unbelievable midfield backline. But I, I think it's still going to take a few games, just the mental side of their game to kind of show on the pitch a little bit. Yeah, improvement from Capetti for sure in this match. Gets his first goal, a great flick header to the back post. And uh, Otanzio was saying afterwards, he just thinks he's starting to understand a little bit better moments when to make the run, when to pressure, how to do it, when to expend energy, uh, how to get the best of the players around him. But I agree, Dave. Swiderski behind him. I don't I don't know why he's not there. All right, let's uh, go rapid fire here. I'll take Dallas Galaxy, Dallas 3, Galaxy 1, seven straight trips to Frisco with L's for the Galaxy. That is crazy. Uh, and it happened again. Jesus Ferreira, two goals. Alan Velasco had a goal. Paul Areola, two assists. Paxton Pomichol, nice little slip ball through to Ferreira for a goal. That's how you draw it up. If you're Nico Estevez after a match day one where you really didn't show a ton of ability to create clear goal scoring chances, the flip side is that the Galaxy are helping you create clear goal scoring chances by, I don't know, letting balls over the top fall so that Paul Areola can square it across the six. Also, that, um, you know, you just, Mavinga's completely lost trying to mark the center forward in the box and just ball watching. I so, think that's more on Casares, that play. But there's a huge Casares is 30 yards up the field. So that's why Mavinga's Okay, then what about marking. what about the third what about the third goal then? Where it's like you know the run that Ferreira's gonna make, you know the angle that Paxton Pomical yeah. has. Why is literally everyone sleeping? Yeah, there's a bad defensive team. So that's that's the answer to all of that. Yes. They didn't get better. Um, and Pooch didn't get a ton of touches in this game, which hurts them because if they're not gonna score goals, they're not gonna be able to win games. Um, but shout out FC Dallas, baby. Yeah. Edwin Cerillo, get it done. <laughs> Cerillo Hive. All right, Atlanta won, Toronto FC won. Uh, Doyle, I wrote in here that Toronto FC are in trouble. It's the Federico Bernadeschi show to me. You've got 
Well, first of all, Diamande goes off with hamstring tightness. So on comes Ayo. Then Ayo goes off with hamstring tightness. Lorenzo Insigne is not available. Might be next weekend, maybe. But they played a very, very defensive sort of you take the ball and, and we'll just defend posture. Mike Newell, um, I just saw this tweet out there, says the burning question for the Toronto Till I Die podcast. Sorry, we're taking your content, Toronto Till I Die. <laughs> Would you be okay with Toronto FC grinding out wins and draws like they did on Saturday if it meant they had to play a more pragmatic style? I, I mean, if I was a fan, I think I would be okay with it. I don't think Bob Bradley will be okay with it. You know, like he's clearly okay with it for now, but in the long term, he wants his team to play like LAFC did in, in 2019. They just don't have the horses for it. Their ability to win the ball back in, in central midfield uh, is not great. Um, they don't cover a ton of ground in terms of that front line defense. Bernard Deshi does, but he, he's incredible. But like the other two guys, even when they're fit, don't do a ton of lifting defensively. So they get pulled around really easily, which means they're kind of constantly retreating every time they don't have the, uh, the ball, which is, is tough. Um, they do have two good center backs guys who can do work in the box. Um, and I think that they might, you know, between that and a veteran goalkeeper who's still very, very, very good, they might have to bow to pragmatism a little bit and say, okay, we're going to, at least until we get our feet under us in terms of fitness, we're going to have to play against the ball and we're going to have to put Bernardeski as the 10 and we're going to have to try to steal results the way they stole a point in this one. What did you see from Atlanta? Giacomacus made his debut, yeah. scored a goal, goal got taken off for offside. I'm not entirely sure it's offside. We won't debate that here. Again, instant replay is your home for all the refereeing decisions. With, with um, VAR and leaving your flag down longer, we should do a sizzle reel of best offside goals finishes of the weekends. Because like there were some great offsides goal. You got to respect the finish anyway. That yeah, that's, uh, that's true. Giacomacus wanted it. He wants a goal in every single match. <laughs> Atlanta fans definitely were in my mentions wanting it. But what did you see from them outside of that lone moment? I thought they were a little more disciplined once they got to the final third in not just launching from 25 yards. Like they were actually trying to work the ball into the box. They're, they weren't as precise as they needed to be. And like one of the worries is like they were really only dangerous when they completely left uh, Andrew Gutman off the hook and like said, okay, you're no longer left back. You're like a second forward or, you know, a, a box crashing midfielder. And like, that's a lot of fun and it generates more danger, um, but it leaves them open to be countered. Uh, so they, like they have some stuff to figure out. They do have the ability to brute force wins um, with the amount of talent that they have. And it looks like Giacomacus is going to be um, a force magnifier in, the, in that regard because he looked very good to me in his brief time out there. All right. Hot potato goes to you, Kalen. Columbus crew, DC United. We hit the Wilfred Nance stuff. Um, but from your perspective, what is Nance building? And I'm, I'm curious what you think about his emphasis on possession because if you watch – this team play and you hear what he said as, as Doyle said there are moments even in transition where his message is okay it might not be there you might feel like push 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 but let's recycle they lost the possession battle to DC and Wilfred Nance was unhappy about that despite the result what's your initial impression of the crew under Nance and what they will look like in the future yeah I think if you look at Wilfred Nance and what he created in Montreal He's trying to do a carbon copy of that in Columbus. I think they have the players. I think they actually have better players in Columbus that fits this system, and I think that's going to continue to grow, and I think this is exactly what Columbus needed. They needed a reset. They needed a manager to come in and play this style because they have all the players to do it. I mean, Darlington Negmi, for me, has been – MLS, I feel like he's been playing for about 35 years. Like the guy is unbelievable with Morris next to him, Hernandez leading the line. I think they have all the tools to do it. And I like this from Wilfred Nancy. He's not willing to go back to your point with Toronto. It's just win to win. He wants to win and he wants to play beautiful football. And I'm I'm good with this. I love this from a manager. I love that. You have tactics, you have a playing philosophy, and you're not willing to accept mediocre performance because they have the players to do it. And that's what I think Toronto needs to do. They can't just accept mediocre performances because they have the players to do and play beautiful football. For me, if a manager has some of the best players 
in Major League Soccer with some of the highest transfers. He's not the right manager for the job if he's not being able to get results. So I think Wilfred Nancy, for me, is a manager that we've seen in Montreal. I mean, we saw how successful he was there. Obviously, Montreal losing all those players. But uh, this Columbus team excites me, and I think the second performance kind of showed, you know, they still, still definitely have work in progress to do. But I do think they have, I hate even using the saying, all the tools in the toolbox to get the job done. <laughs> but you know, I, I completely I love agree. It. I completely agree. I thought one thing from your column, Doyle, that really like resonated with me was what Nance got from guys like Georgie and now mm-hmm. what he will be able to get from similarly with Cucho and Zalarayan and others of like, I know exactly how to get the most out of your particular skill set. We will have the ball and get you the ball in positions to do what you do best. Yeah. And this is just the start for the crew. All right. New England three, one of the unbeatens, Houston Dynamo zero. Uh, this is an incredible stat. Uh, again, from Opta, Revs won their first two matches of a regular season for the first time in their 28-year history. Wow, that is a long. It time. was a great. It was a. I think it was a great tweet from one of the people at the regeneration of the bent musket, which I bought this shirt to support them because a lot of the SB Nation blogs um, not getting funding. So if you like your MLS local coverage, please see how you can go support. I saw the mainland put out theirs um, as well. They were like, congratulations to us in St. Louis. It took them two weeks, and it took us 27 years <laughs> to get to this point. Uh, Latif Blessing. Blazing uh, Musket is the new yes, one. Thank Blazing you, Musket. Yeah, Latif Blessing, uh, big-time performer in this one, Doyle. But I want to focus you in on our 22 under 22 player of the weekend. That is Dylan Barrero, who last year was sort of a, uh, you know, like, well, let's wait and see. Like, he's got to settle, and now he's got maybe gas there and player of the year written all over him. When when he was, I, I don't think you could give him Goss there because he was awesome last year when he was healthy. Yeah, it, like it was it was just like if if he could stay on the pitch, this kid is gonna be everything that they just lost in Tejan Buchanan. Like he was a, a like for like, um, but. What's interesting about it is when Bruce used Tejan two years ago in that four four two diamond, they played a wide diamond, right? They had they were creating wide overloads because that's what Bruce always want, always wants to do by releasing the shuttlers, and that's where Tejan played. What we've seen through two games this year is they're playing a narrow diamond where Latif on one side uh, as the right side shuttler and uh, and Noel Buck on the other side. They're t- they're staying tight to Matt Polster, which means that they can't get outnumbered in central midfield in the way that the Revs did against NYCFC or the crew in the playoffs. <laughs> so it's a tactical adjustment in that way, and it gives Carlos Heel obviously, a free roll. That means it, it puts it on Dylan Barrero, who's now playing as a second forward, to help create those wide overloads because the shuttlers aren't releasing. And he was absolutely brilliant in this game doing that. He was finding the right spots when he was strong side to for combination play. And then if you look at his goal, like it's basically a winger's goal. He's playing as a second forward, but it's basically a winger's goal because he's coming from the, the back shoulder of the fullback, like blind side, getting inside of him and finishing one time. It was like, it was just a really, really comprehensive performance. The asterisk I have to put there is it was home against Houston particularly a Houston side that was getting it was getting dominated in central midfield because again of the very good tactical shift that I think Bruce has made um in those games if you're a good like you should win and you should look good in those moments so it's like he hit the necessary bar uh we'll see what happens next week Doyle Uh, it took us an hour and nine minutes and we fully agree with one another. Oh, there you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's yeah. We're working towards nice. <laughs> no, we're not, nice. Agreement is not good. Kalen does <laughs> not produce content. We don't want agreements. I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. Carlos David Monzon, very happy to hear that uh, that breakdown from Doyle. He had hit us up and said, for two weeks now, I had to listen to you on extra time and also on MLS wrap up. Not mention Dylan Barrero as the top upcoming player on the Revs team. Georgie Petrovich aside, week one, Buck gets love. But oh my God, if I have to listen to another extra time podcast. <laughs> Not talking about Dylan Barrera's ability as the next Tejon. I want a new award created as the biggest sleeper player that you guys <laughs> failed to see coming. Sorry for my rant. John Duran. We can name it the John Duran. Yeah, the, right. John, yeah, the John Duran player of the year. Check I'm glad because I put Barrero on my U22, my 2020-22 last year over Duran. So that helps. Me. Hey, you were there. You yeah. were there. How about this, Dave? Uh, take Austin Montreal here. So Kip Keller, correct me if I'm wrong, not even in the 18, which was an interesting move, I thought, uh, from Austin. But it worked out. Alex Ring started at center back. I thought that was one of their better options, and they went with it. Uh, Maxi Aruti, 88th-minute winner. Seven of his 10 regular season goals for Austin have been winners. That's a pretty interesting stat. So 
Get your bow and arrow out. Shoot it into the sky. Dan Menendez said, stock down on Zardes. Missed four opportunities, and I'm afraid it's not going to work out already, to be honest. And uh, Samwise the Fool hit me up and said, hey, Zardes had 51 touches in 162 minutes. That's uh, four shots, not on goal. Doyle pointed out the pass map between Driussi and Zardes in his column. If you saw that pass map, you just basically saw a blank field, like two passes in there. Is this a short-term problem like Doyle suggested, um, or have they just not gelled, or is it a bigger deal? Is Zardes playing his way out of the starting job just a few games in, especially after how Aruti changed the game off the bench? So, Dave, Jesse Zardes in Austin. What do you think so far? Uh, obviously, he hasn't finished the chances. Um, he did bang one in. He was offside. He did not know. And I'm giving him half credit for that. And Rigoni, I think, was a str- no, I think Rigoni was a struggle in front of goal in this one. I think we saw a few good moments, though, where Zardes dropped in to the left-hand channel and helped link up and actually get Fagundes into the box. And then Drew Risi can come in as he does and be a finisher. So I'm not worried about their fit yet because I do think Zardes has played in this league with a lot of different players at a high level. And he can drop off the front line if that's what's needed and help the team in the buildup. Um, but there is obviously, and, and I would add to that, Maxi Aruti becomes less effective as a starter. Like if he, he is a super sub, he has proven in this league that you will not win consistently with him starting every single game. Hence why Zardes and Bruin are there. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't just take it as Rudy scores goals. So Zardes has to sit because I think all of it fits together for this team to be at their best. Um, and ring playing at center back is also a good option for them because Owen Wolf looks really good. And I think Owen Wolf won the center midfield job for them. And you need somewhere to put Alex ring. I don't think you want a DP leader on the bench who thinks he's still a starter. Um, and Owen Wolf, of course, will go probably to the U twenties and be away for a bit of time. But I thought Alex ring looked fine in that spot. Montreal doesn't have creators like Montreal. They replaced some of what they lost. They did nothing to replace Ismail Kone. They did nothing to replace Georgia Mihailovic. That is a clear flaw in that team in saying that Kyoto still created two or three really big, big chances for them that the kids didn't put away. Uh, and I thought after Austin blitzed Montreal out the gates, uh, Montreal settled in and played better, but you know, it, it's going to take a little bit of time. I, I think I said, I don't know that Austin's going to take the step they're going to take from last year is not that they're going to win supporter shield. I think it's that they're going to confidently step into any cup game and believe they can win those competitions. So I don't know that the challenge for them is to get 75 points over the course of 34 games. And I think they're still building into CCL, which is going to be their first chance. Uh, Violette this week on Tuesday, three MLS teams in action on Tuesday in CONCACAF Champions League. Justin Shepard hit us up and said, hey guys, thoughts on Toy getting zero minutes thus far this season, even though Montreal have needed a goal in both games. And then we got one of the best emails of all time from Ryan, uh, an avid fantasy player. Who do I complain to after I selected Mason Toy for two weeks in my fantasy team? (laughs) Angry face. If the responsible party could refund me $7 million in fantasy bucks, that would be much appreciated. Rest assured, I won't use it to buy Duncan McGuire because he's not even in the game. Whose fault was it? Yours. All of you. We. I don't think anyone picked Toy in the in the Golden Boot Draft. No, year. no, I don't, think, so, I don't think so. Only one person would have, to be fair. Yeah, only it would only so, would have been me. <laughs> that would have been just I you. I still believe. Yeah, uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Sorry about that, Ryan. Chicago Fire won, NYCFC won. A big week for NYCFC. James Sands and Santi Rodriguez are back. Sands started, came off what, 73rd minute, something like that, and then uh, Santi came on as a sub. Kalen, bad news for the Fire. Jairo Torres and Fede Navarro off with first-half injuries, and then Casper Shabilko pulled at the half for Kai Kamara, who I just cannot imagine is not going to be the starter for them at the nine. Um, what did you think about this week for NYCFC with Sands and Santi returning? I'm hard on NYCFC because I don't think they've done a good enough job with the building blocks of players that they have transferred out of that team. Um, and I, I said that even before the season started, they don't impress me. They, they don't have anything. When you, when you look at NYCFC, when you had someone like a Castellanos there, that was someone that you would circle every week to say he's going to create, create something, even if the team is playing bad. I don't think that they have a difference maker on that team, an individual difference maker on that team. So when they aren't playing at home, when they are playing on the road, when the field's bigger, the field's more open up, there's more space, there's more in transition. I just don't see NYCFC being competitive in the East anymore without 
a player of Castellanos. I just don't think they've done a good enough job. They didn't impress me against Chicago, if I'm being completely honest. Um, I don't know. They're just they're just a team that I used to always tune in and be like, this is a fun team to watch. They're creative. I mean, when Villa was there, and I don't know, they just don't. Ha- they haven't done a good enough job in the offseason replacing big name players. I think the weight on Santi is really hurting them. I do think Gabby Pereira can be that player. I do think Tyus Magno is that player at wing. Um, but, you know, we go back Pereira to Pereira's not that player yet. No. That's the problem. And that's the problem with both those guys is neither of them are that player every game. So you don't have, to, to Kalen's point, you don't have a guarantee. And in some MLS teams or teams that I think... Isn't Sant- Santi's your guarantee, right? Maybe. I don't know. He's not on the roster. He was. I, he, yeah, not he's, now, he's, but he was this all last season. Okay, but um, no, he wasn't. He was. Maxi, yes, he was. No. He, no, he I wasn't. I mean, Maxi, Maxi, was. Maxi was a bad, but like you have to have a, a, a like a, 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 a transition to the younger 10 that you've brought in and had on the roster for two years. And like that eventually comes for everyone. It's going to come for Seattle. It came for Portland. Like, and this is, this is the hope is that Santi is going to be that guy as a 10. He was the sidekick last year. He was a very good sidekick. Like, I thought he was just as good as Facundo Torres, you know, just as good as Tiago Almada. It's just like he, but, because he but, was in the shadow of the guys who had been there for that oh, wait, long. Wait, wait. Orlando was the last team in the playoffs and Atlanta didn't make the playoffs because, and part of the reason was those players didn't have enough help. So if Santi Rodriguez has to be Maxi and Santi this year, then that's not enough help. So I don't think he team. has to be Maxi and Santi, right? I think the idea is he becomes Maxi and then Pereira or hopefully Talis Magno can play in their natural spots on the wing. And like, yeah, it's a young team and it's unproven, but like young teams grow and the, one thing that NYCFC has done really well is develop young players. I do totally agree, though. Kalen's point, like you, like Talis Magno's not it as his number nine. Tiago Andrade, who came in and played number nine in the second half for the second straight week, he he's not it either. Um, and I think the whole thing is going to look uninspired and uninspiring until they answer that like i'm good with the rest of their moves i love that santi's back i love that they're transitioning to a new era with him and like you know doubling down on the bet they made on this kid a couple years ago i love that sands is back like he and parks should work really well again like it might not matter if they don't get a real center forward in there and and like talis magno is maybe the best left winger in the league when he's playing on the left wing we have seen 15 games of him at center forward now like it's just not it's not working uh, all right, San Jose, Vancouver. Uh, Dave, you want the Lucci watch here? First win for Lucci in San Jose. Dramatic I mean, one. Jeremy Abobasi is a real center forward. Two goals on the season. Wonderful header from him. Akpo with the winner. Vancouver looks good for 55, 60 minutes. And wah, wah. Yeah, I think they look good for 55 minutes. Say, they, looked, okay, good they looked fine. They looked fine. They looked like they're going to win on the road. No, good, good is debatable. They got a goal fine. against the run of play. <laughs> They looked like they got pulled apart a ton. And credit to San Jose for sticking to what was working and not panicking and not moving away from it. They find Espinosa in really good spots. He is going to be so much fun to watch this year because he's going to get more touches. It's going to make sense more in the flow of the team. Um, Grueso is a big difference maker. I made a joke and, and texted Kalen Carr. I don't know what we're going to call the two. Yeah, I, don't know we're gonna... this. This is um, I love it. We need to both be on at the same time. Yeah. Really and just start yelling we'll Kalen. Do, we'll do it like kindergarten. Kalen with a C, Kalen with a K. You yeah, know what well, I mean? We can also just go by last names. That's if yeah. you guys want as well. <laughs> um, but, you See, know, there's a, well. there's a moment where San Jose almost gets hit on their own corner kick, which is a Matias Almeida special. Grayso comes in, clears out the attacking player, wins the tackle, and then the goal it's what seven, eight passes from left to right. It's Kate Cowell beating guys one v one. It's um, it's having your attacking players have the awareness to find the next player. And Espinosa not forcing the shot from a central area, but finding your right back. Who it's an unbelievable finish on top of all of that. Uh, but it was a really good moment. I think San Jose right now. There's more balance in this team. Yeah. They can start to anticipate the fullbacks can get forward because they know what's going to happen. And I thought Mensa has fit in pretty well in terms of helping them pass out of the back. So I think San Jose fans should be excited. It was an awesome atmosphere. Shea Selena, Selena's there, you know, rocking the the bell before the game. Like it's everything San Jose wants to sort of turn the page 
And, and I thought it was another step from week one in, Adla- in Atlanta. Got to get Shea ringing that bell now while he's the assist leader because they ain't going to last for long. Christian Espinoza is three behind him in club yeah. history, which is a pretty incredible stat on that one. Congratulations to Lucci. Big win for San Jose. Let's hit these scoreless draws. There are three of them, and I'll just give you some bullet points. Red Bulls, Nashville. Honey off the bench once again at halftime. This time he couldn't change the game with a goal or a goal created. Uh, Dante Vanzier uh, off the bench to make his debut. And outside of that, watch the highlights if you want to. But Supra- don't, don't, Sup- don't. Sopranos don't. Tifo. Yeah. Was the that was, of that the was game. sick. Yeah, that was the sick. Sopranos sure. Tifo was great. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rapid zero, Sporting Kansas City zero. Darren Yappy once again starting. I thought he had his first goal. It was offside. That's a bummer. I, like him. I yeah. think he's a bright spot. I do like him. Sorry, go keep going. No, no, no. That's, a, that's what we're here for. We're here for... Just boom. We like Darren Yappy, but uh, once again, no, no. And then Orlando City and FC Cincinnati. Also scoreless, Orlando rotated. Uh, Poppy trying to keep his boys fresh for Tigres and CCL this week. That is going to be quite the test. We'll talk about that in just one second. And uh, Cincinnati looking good, Doyle, but not getting the result. What's your What's your quick thought? They look good. They didn't get a result. Nice. Well done. <laughs> All right. CCL fever is back. Uh, we are prepped for disappointment. Uh, Free Space, as always, is out there waiting for us. Uh, FS1, FS2, Fox Soccer Plus is your home for these matches. Tuesday, three games. You've got uh, you've got Austin in in Haiti, I believe, against Violette at 6 p.m. Eastern. And then 8 p.m. Eastern is Alianza Philadelphia. That's at Estadio Cuscatlan in San Salvador. And then Tigres hosting Orlando at Estadio Universitario El Volcan is where we will have those three games. So three away games in CONCACAF, big tests. The home uh, leg will be the second leg for these teams. We'll see if that is encouraging uh, or if Orlando comes home really needing to score some goals. TBD on that one. Then you've got Vancouver hosting Real España on Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern. And then Thursday, LAFC is going to Alhoense to uh, Costa Rica to uh, the Alejandro Morera Soto. So those are our five teams in CONCACAF Champions League. Doyle, um, should we gird ourselves now for disappointment? Should we be enthusiastic and hopeful? Should we be hopeful knowing that our hearts will be broken? Where do you stand (laughs) on this year's edition of CONCACAF Champions League? I'm pretty sure, and we talked about this in the pre-show, it, it seems like the, the the bottom half of that bracket is setting up pretty well for an MLS team to come through. That, that half of the bracket has uh, the Union, LAFC, and Vancouver, three MLS teams, and only one Liga MX team. Atlas, who of course won the double, uh, like won two straight titles, I should say, last year, but they have fallen off hard since then. Um it feels like one of those teams should come through. The other side of the bracket is is really tough, specifically because Tigres are in there, and they they um, they have a lot of the great names of Tigres in years past. They went out and they spent twelve million, I think, this off season on uh, Nico Ibanez, who was of course uh, so great for. Uh, for Pachuca over the past couple of years. Um, they will dominate you in, in central midfield. They have a um, flamboyant and often fun and sometimes match winning goalkeeper. They are the, I, I think they are the clear favorites. Um, and it's going to be really, really, really tough for Orlando city uh, to, to get past them uh, in this home and home. Kaylin, rank for me in your mind the (laughs) odds of MLS teams winning CCL. Who would be the most likely? Who's the most likely team to win it? I'm either going Philly or LAFC. Nope, choose one. Choose one. Let me just think midfield battle between – I'm going to go Philly. All right, Philly. So that would make LAFC your two, I'm guessing. Yeah. Okay, who would be the third most likely? Vancouver, Austin, Orlando. Orlando. No, I, uh, I would I, say Austin over Orlando. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Austin. Then, then yeah. you have um, then Orlando fourth or Vancouver fourth. Vancouver's on the more charitable side of the bracket, probably. I know, but they just have not looked good, have they? I'm gonna go Orlando and then Vancouver. Okay. 
I'm going to get have this it. criticism up uh, in Canada. Sorry, my to my fellow Canadians. Well, that's the way it goes right now for Vancouver. Vanny Sartini saying, boy, I thought we were going to try to start different than last year. I, but. I will say I appreciate having someone on the show who actually pronounces Montreal correctly, and we don't need to say resident Canadian anymore. So that, I did. You know what? That was part of my lead to the show and my mental notes, and I forgot we, to hit it. We, we yeah, have we, called David Goss our resident We don't Canadian. have a Canadian on this yeah, show. So now we do. And we are a... Huh? How do you pronounce Montreal? You say like Montreal, which is correct. Yeah. And is we say Montreal because we're how do you say, okay, how do you say Toronto? Toronto. Oh, it's yeah. Toronto. Drop the T, guys. I Come can't. Run. It just oh, sounds so Montreal. unnatural. Toronto. Montreal. Montreal. It's Montreal. like me saying Narlins. Toronto. Okay. okay, I can do this. All right, we'll end with a, with mail from Maui McClure. And of course, on Thursday, we will do, a, again, a full mailbag show. I think we're going to stick with that format for now. Uh, an update on the cast. We So we're joking about two Kalins. Kaylin Carr is moving to, we tape on Wednesdays. The show will come out Thursday morning. So it will be Dave, myself, uh, Doyle and Kaylin on Wednesdays show coming out Thursday. So that's the old Monday crew. So we're keeping Kaylin around. I know Anders, just one man, just one Mally McClure. Thanks for assigning Stuart a team. Stuart's her husband. He's decided to go with Montreal, Montreal because he likes their logo and that they're a bit of a wild card. And Montreal sounds like a really cool city to visit. He is now following them on Twitter, but might have to learn French to keep up. Also, we were both very entertained by your chat about him being a lost MLS cause at the end of the last episode. To clarify, Stewart does like going to Sanders games, and he has a good time. But as he put it, Andrew's take on him just tolerating my fandom around the house and me trying to lock him in is shockingly accurate. So thanks for the laugh. Thanks for trying to help me get him fully locked in, maybe by the end of the season. He'll be listening to full episodes with me and watching Montreal. Thank you, Mallory, for being can a part add, of the... Can I add to Mallory? Poutine. Mm-hmm. They're going to be your best friend up in Montreal. They make nice. the best ones in Canada. So, uh, little tidbit, so it's just right? a wonderful place to be in the summer. <laughs> arrange that Arrange that road trip now, <laughs> Mallory. And we've got more team road assignments trip. coming uh, on Thursday. <laughs> yes, show, people so. driving cross continents. It's, there's flights, Dave. You can't. Yeah, you just said road trip. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a turn of phrase. Oh, man. Anything. The Midwest in him. Just, oh, Denver's 11 hours? I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, not even, it's not even a long drive. All right, that's it for us. I uh, hope you enjoyed Match Day 2, MLS 360, MLS Wrap Up, all the coverage on MLS Season Pass on Apple TV. Make sure you get your subscription. We will see you on Thursday. Have a great week. Adios, everybody.